The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, upon reflection with Al Page. Our guest is Ozzie Davis, actor, writer, and a guest lecturer at the University of Washington. Can Ozzie Davis, the actor, really do justice to Ozzie Davis, the writer? Is it hard to do your own stuff? It was. I think I could do justice to it now. But when I did Pearly Victorious in uh, 1962, there were several things that Pearly, as a character, was supposed to do that I was totally uncomfortable in doing, and, and I couldn't do it. Such as? Well, um, there was a scene in which Pearly was was being forced by Gitlo to beg to crawl to get some money. And so <laughs> Pearly asks him politely, he said, no, no, do it like you do for white folks. Well, <laughs> you had no practice. <laughs> no, no, it was that I had had the experience coming from the South and the practice, but I couldn't with the public watching me too. I could, now I could do it now as an actor, but believe me, I was a failure <laughs> in, in crawling uh, as, as required by the part. But what is the difference in putting down the passion for something on a piece of paper and trying to act out those words? Are they really two different things? Uh, they are two different things, but uh, in a sense they joined at the hip, you know, like Siamese twins. They are different in the sense that the writer is discovering and putting the form and substance in, in a definitive relationship for the first time. And when he gets it right, it is right forever, and he doesn't have to bother with it anymore. Mm -hmm. The actor, on the other hand, every time there is a performance, has to come at it as if it has never happened before. And uh, it has to be, it almost has to catch him by surprise every time. And this is true whether he's doing what he has written or somebody else. The, the trick of the actor is to be totally realistic in response as if the stimulus was true and real and immediate and you'd never experienced it before. The now truth could, is that you have. Can you train yourself to experience it? Yes, you can. How do you train yourself? Well, one of the technical ways you train yourself is by what we call uh, improvisation. Uh, in improvisation, you're supposed to respond uh, as a character would respond uh, without having any lines or cues given to you in advance. So that whatever's said to you, you've got to react to it right then. And what is required is a certain amount of confidence. One of the reasons we don't do it normally is because we're always afraid of making a fool out of ourselves. We, we have to take quick thoughts. Is this stupid? Is it? But when you learn to trust yourself, to be open and let whatever it is you, inside you have total freedom of expression, uh, it frees you and so that when you are on stage, you can dare to almost forget where you are and what you're doing and have it come at you. you. You never totally forget. Nobody ever trusts himself that much. Can you know when you really hit it? Can you walk off and say, this time I'll really hit it? Yes. How do you know? Uh, a feeling of, of completion, a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling that everything has gone uh, together correctly for the first time. Now, the satisfaction also leads to a danger because the temptation then is to go the next night and play the music back for the previous night. So I, I know it all. I know, I know I, that piece. So in other words, it becomes a set piece. And you say, here comes my big moment. Oh, man, am I going to knock him in the aisles tonight? And that's when you're in trouble? That's when you're in trouble. You, you, you're, 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 you're playing the memory of something you did before. You have to disavow that totally and completely. If you have a magnificent moment, you have to back away from it before it traps you. You have to get out of town, take a whole different uh, approach, uh, concentrate on another aspect of the scene, another part of the line, 
Uh, otherwise, you, you trick and trap yourself. Let's talk about portraying emotions. Is it easier to portray rage as opposed to love, which can range from the physical to the spiritual? Well, I, I don't think that you can measure the ease by the nature of, of the emotion. I, I think what you have to be able to do is to respond appropriately to whatever the emotional stimuli uh, is that is set before you. Uh, and appropriately means not too much and not too little. You, you, you very seldom hit it head on. You, you know, you, you land a little short of it, a little over it, so that every night you have the challenge of, of, of trying to, to hit it each time, because otherwise it would become mechanical to you. But it's like, the, you know, the, the guy who's trying to kick the field goal, you know, no matter how many times he's done it, it's now and the, there's the goal post and you've got to get it just right that particular challenge. Is it difficult for actors to take charge of their own lives when their principal job is repeating the words of others? I really wouldn't know. I have never been only an actor in my life, number one. Number two, I didn't set out to be an actor. It wasn't where I was going. And number three, uh, because I didn't set out to be an actor, I never took it seriously until you know, way late in my life. I was not like my wife who trains herself to be an actress and who was always uh, committed to the craft. You hedged your bets. I hedged my bets. And, but, but sometimes on stage, Ruby would be giving me notes and telling me things about the performance, which she, which she shouldn't do to an actor. But she was so appalled by the awful things I was doing. <laughs> she was trying to shake me up. But I, di I didn't care. I, I said to myself, look, I'm not an actor. I, I'm a writer. I'm just out here tonight to, you know, to give somebody the lines. I didn't take it seriously. As a writer, how much of your guts do you spill on the page? You spill all and some more. But what you are aiming at as a writer is that ultimately the spill has to have discipline, it has to have form, it has to have its own shape. Uh, for example, I am a great, I'm a devotee of gospel music. I love it, and yet I have seen gospel from Homer sometimes mm -hmm. who were so indulgent of themselves that I backed away from them and the song. No, no discipline. No discipline, that, that, that's, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So for a writer, it is often said that it is in the rewriting that you ultimately write what it is you're trying to say. If, for example, I go full out on a page and write it, the chances are that when I read it, I will know that I've gone too far. But how do you really know that you've just said something as opposed to just amusing yourself on paper? What makes you a writer is the su supreme, sublime confidence mm -hmm. that you can say it as, as God would have said it had he chosen to write those words. You must believe mm -hmm. that you can say it in a, so that it will be said that way forever. You know, you must, you must have that confidence. And then be able to walk away from it. Then walk away from it and, and leave it, not tamper with it. Have you ever worked on a piece where you had the front part kind of right and the back part kind of right, but you'd be damned to figure out how to make the two pieces fit together to work out the transition? Not exactly, because that's the way I write. I will write the front piece and the back piece and then fill in what leads from one to the other. Uh, the pieces, the things that give me difficulty uh, do, not, do not come from the position they have in the piece. Uh, I have difficulty when I cannot put my finger precisely on what I'm trying to say or I have too many answers to the same question, which means I really have no answer at all. I haven't thought it through. I can say it too many ways, all of them clever, but which one is the better way? So how to winnow it out. Yeah, and, and sometimes I never get through with the winnowing process. Uh, uh, sometimes you might find that you were going in the wrong direction anyway. Uh, or that's, uh, it's not about that. Is this like writing a piece and discovering you're writing four or five pieces at the same time? Yeah, mm -hmm. this is true, or, 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 or even writing something diametrically opposed to what you set out to write. You spoke a moment ago about anger, spilling your gut on the page. 
I started one time to write a one-act play based on anger coming from a real incident in my life. I bet you were young. I was young. I was a child. And I was in Waycross, Georgia. And uh, on some occasions, you know, coming home from school, the, the sheriff or somebody would pick us kids up and take us down and just sit, leave us sitting in the jail for the afternoon and they give you some peanut candy or something and take you on home. This was their idea of play and all that sort of thing. And I was going to write a, a story about a young boy picked up like that and his mother being sent for and she would have to beat him in order for them to let him out of prison. And as I thought of it and I wrote it, the anger in me, you know, uh, the, the, the meanness of the whole situation. And I wrote it and I wrote it and I, I felt everything I wrote. But on the following morning when I read it, you know, something kept saying, was it really that way? Uh, did it actually happen? And I'm quarreling with myself about this. You know, I said, well, look, the, the essence of the piece is there. What are you asking these questions? I said, yeah, but, and it took me six, seven, eight, nine months a year to write the piece. It ultim ultimately became a comedy. It became Pearly Victorious, which had nothing to do with a little boy in jail <laughs> being insulted or being uh, threatened. What I'm trying to say is that I expressed my rage and I expressed it fully and I thought it was a legitimate rage. I'm a little black boy in a mean racist South and they vent their disregard of my personality and dignity upon me and I should react like that. And then you had to apply a craft. A craft. And ultimately, something deep in me, something that was also part of my culture, gave me the anecdote to the anger that I was expressing, which is humor. And uh, it is only many years later that I began to understand how that could come about. L let me tell you what I mean by that. My daddy was a great storyteller, and so was my mama. And they told stories, uh, the traditional stories, of course, but the ones we liked most were the stories of their own adventures. And daddy's adventures always were about some incident in which he, as a black man, barely got by with his life and confronting the white oppressive cruelty around him. And he emerged the hero. He emerged the hero, but it, uh, not by challenging or by force of arms, but by mother wit or by some kind of device. And we would laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh and laugh. It was only later that I understood that what my father had done, whether deliberately or not, was to not only introduce me to the violence possible in the environment in which I lived, but also showed me how to deal with it. Showed you a way out. To laugh at it. So he'd done a very valuable thing to me. Now, when I sat down to write Pearly, not knowing it, you know, I, I responded as a man is supposed to respond. But in the context of the times and the place in which I came, that kind of response could get you killed. You see what I mean? So you don't respond that way if you intend to survive. You have other ways. And I had been taught those other ways. And when I dug deep enough in myself, that became the, the, the mechanism that ultimately launched me on writing a full-fledged comedy. You talked about capturing this rage when you were young. Another thing young people have is hope, dreams. Did you capture your hopes, your dreams, and your writing when you were young? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we and my family were never without hope. It, uh, <laughs> sometimes that's all we had <laughs> for breakfast was hope. It's hard to eat. Yeah, it is. But there was mama, and there was daddy, and there was granddad, and all those people around. There was the community. And uh, uh, something in the tradition, something in the culture, uh, was always hopeful. Uh, you know, there was always hope somehow. And I expressed it in, in the way, and in, in the things I wrote, in the ways that I wrote them. Mature artists have experienced disappointments and frustrations in their life. As you get older, can you still portray the hopes and the dreams of the young? Does it become more difficult? No. Hope is hope and is universal. And uh, what, what, one, what one would have to do would to be sure that uh, you know in detail what a young person is or who a young person is, and then expose that youth 
and that uh, young way of thinking to hope and get the response. Uh, the obverse is true. Uh, I just finished uh, 13 months playing uh, Midge Carter uh, in uh, uh, I'm Not Rappaport. And Midge Carter is a very old man. And what I had to do was, and he was a man who had anger, but also hope. And a great deal of experience. And a great deal of experience. But I had to, with the help of the director, find what oldness meant in terms of muscles, in terms of eyes, in terms of attitude, and in terms of body posture, in terms of stiffness of the limbs. Probably scared the hell out of you. <laughs> it really did. But out of that, the hope or the humor or whatever fire uh, I had could come forth freely. Once I had mastered the craft of, in, you know, of, of wrapping it in old age uh, 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 formula or whatever then you form, can, then, you then I could it. express it. So I, I feel that if I had to, pay, to play now, at my age, if I had to play a child of five or six or seven, I could do it. I could suggest that, you know. Maybe. I saw Charlie, Charlie Chaplin play a rose once. And limelight, I don't know if you saw that, you know. The ultimate method actor. Yeah, can be done, sure. Let's change the subject a bit. Earlier, you talked about universality. When you portray the black experience, are you portraying a unique culture, or are you portraying universal emotions? And, and, and the way that I, I look upon the, they're one and the same thing. Uh, when I portray the black experience, what I'm doing is expressing uh, through art, through performance, some elements of the culture into which I was born as a black American, uh, black number one, and as an American, there is a culture. Uh, it had and has an energy. It has a focus. It has a purpose. It has a place and a context. I am a product of all of that. So when I play fully myself as a human being, as a man, as a scoundrel, as a murderer, as a lover, all of those elements of my culture come into play. Therefore, when you see me on stage, you see a man. You see also a black man. And you see in the man, or in res uh, the man in response to mm -hmm. some situations, his, a, universal, a universality in terms of his response. All human beings uh, fall in love, but a black man falls in love blackly in the sense that the opportunity, the way, the object would come from his concept of himself as a person. And in America, my self-concept has a black connotation. How do you get young people to internalize the kind of notions that you're talking about as opposed to just being exposed to those notions? It's, it's very difficult. Uh, what is needed and what we haven't got, and this is true not only for blacks, but for all young people in American society, we need the institutions. Institutions, cultural institutions, tend to focus the culture and tends to, uh, to establish the rituals by which the culture repeats and maintains its values, and it tends to indoctrinate the practitioner in all those elements of the culture in an organized fashion. We all ethnic groups have surrendered much of the ritual of their culture. You know, we are ritualized now more by television than we are by our cultural institutions. So all of our young people, black, white, and otherwise, come up with a great deal of cultural shallowness because those instruments and institutions which might have enriched them are no longer available to them. Now, I don't know at the moment how to restore that except to go back to those institutions, but how can you do that in the, in the cultural climate that, that we have now? I want to pursue that a little bit. There is a significant body of black art which has been accumulated over time. How important is Harlem, the energy of Harlem, to that accumulation? Harlem was that place in the Western Hemisphere where the whole black sense of identity came into focus. It became a spiritual capital. 
Bearing in mind that the blacks who came to this shore came from various places and various cultures and various languages that never even known each other, but they came and they were transformed and translated from what they were by the American experience, the, ho the horrible parts of the American experience and the good parts of the American experience into a new entity. And they had to learn about each other. About each other, but even so, there were blacks in the South and blacks in the North. There were slaves, uh, blacks, and free blacks. There were educated blacks, and there were middle-class blacks. And we all were in various places until suddenly there was that city, that place to which we could all go and be summed up in our identity. Uh, Harlem, in a sense, was the home of our wandering spirits, though we'd never been there. We know that that's the place we had to get to for refuge, for definition, for identification. To get to Harlem was to be whole and sufficient and safe. You talked about an institution, Lenox Avenue in Harlem, the Schomburg Center. How important is that? That's important uh, in many aspects. Uh, let, let's say that the traditional services that a museum will serve is to collect and preserve and carry some artifacts and embodiments of the past on into the future because those things were important to the life of the tribe or the group all along. Now, it is, that's the static value, but the Schomburg provides also a dynamic value in this sense. We, speaking now of my own group, uh, are suffering from the cultural shock that comes from many sources. We were agricultural, now we are urban. We were southern, now we are northern. Uh, we used to have those jobs in unskilled labor, uh, but now unskilled labor is not available to us anymore. We used to have to work in a production economy, now it's a service economy. A thousand changes have, have, have taken place, and all of those changes have had its impact on the Harlem community. The introduction of drugs, um, the deterioration of the housing stock, the moving away of uh, blacks when the opportunities to uh, integrate neighborhoods came from Harlem into outer places. All of these constitute shocks against the cultural body. So you need some common strand to pin hopes on. So, so that the Schomburg not only has the past, but it also helps to knit together the separate fragments. The, 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 we've sort of fragmented ourselves. The Schomburg sort of it pulls us together once again. It focuses us. It gives us a kind of oneness that, that we need more desperately now than we needed before. I want to change the subject once again. Can you look at a piece of literature these days and still be moved to tears? Or do you look at literature from the craftsman's point of view? Oh, no. Uh, I, I, I read for enjoyment. Who still gets to you? Uh, Shakespeare gets to me. The Bible gets to me. Langston Hughes gets to me. Jimmy Baldwin gets to me. Toni Morrison. Uh, Thomas Wolfe still gets to me. Uh, other playwrights, I can be moved very deeply, easily with these things. Poetry too? Poetry. Uh, as a matter of fact, I use these, these parts of the art to, to, to feed my feelings. There are times when for me, I need to cry, not about a specific thing, but about the totality of the human experience. You know, I look at my grandchild and I know that I will leave that child in a world and I don't know what will happen to that child. And that moment to me, you know, almost makes me speechless. And, and there is a section that, that I can think of that helps. One is this, that there, there is uh, King David when his son was killed, uh, son that had led an army against him was killed, and he said, Absalom, oh Absalom, my son, my son, would God I had died for thee, oh Absalom, my son, my son. And I think of my child 
of my grandchild in that context. And it helps me to deal emotionally with the child, or if it's, if it's the granddaughter, a love poem, a sonnet, whatever. Uh, I, I use the sources of my emotion ruthlessly, but I, I, but I don't cheat, you know, and, and I don't exploit my feelings. But it know. keeps you humble. Yeah, it does, and it keeps me rich and alive, and my juices, my spiritual juices flow, and flow frequently. <laughs> Copiously, I would say. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life? Uh, a good question. I'm going to honor at last the commitment that was made in my name before I was ever born, and which I've been putting off forever and ever and ever. I was born to be a writer. And the one thing I ain't done very much of in all my life, and I've done a thousand things, has been to write. So from now on, and I'll be 70 in 10 days or so. Whatever's left to me, I am going to focus those days and those times on my original commitment. I'm gonna write. No matter how fat the contracts? You'd be surprised how, how fat the contracts ain't and how much, <laughs> they, don't, how much they don't come. The truth of uh, our economic st uh, stability in this world and the opportunities that Ruben and I have, most of them, have been opportunities that we ourselves have made. And you're going to write with style? Uh, yes, because I can do it with great style now. Ozzie Davis, actor, writer, and a guest lecturer at the University of Washington, upon reflection. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org classics.